First Minute Capital is a $250 million seed fund founded in 2017 and proudly backed by a number of star technology founders, including over 100 unicorn founders. The My First Minute series is an opportunity to talk to some of the world's top founders, investors and thought leaders around how they got started, some battles that they fought along the way and how they think about the world today. Part of our DNA at First Minute is to take the wisdom and lessons learned from one generation of successful entrepreneurs and share those lessons with the next generation of rising stars. And that's really what this series, My First Minute, is about. My name is Spencer Crawley. I'm co-founder and general partner at First Minute Capital. And today I'm speaking to Roloff Beuter and Ben Lovett. But we're back with a bang today uh, with Ben and Roloff, and just a real, real treat to have them both for an hour. Uh, we've caught Roloff just before us to call all hands, and uh, and it's really, really nice to have you both. So Ben, Roloff, thank you both for joining. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and actually, um, at a suggestion of Ben, you know, they actually made my life very easy by volunteering to introduce themselves. Ben, over to you. Cool. Yeah, I think um, <sighs> nice to meet everyone um the, the context around my life is really uh, centered around people uh, I'm, I'm obsessed with people have been since a young age um i've got three siblings i was the youngest so kind of immediately came into quite a uh, quite a large group um and then i always was a social being all the way through school i went to school in london uh to a day school there and then um, had a dream that I was going to be an astrophysicist, worked very hard at school and, and went and began that journey, actually um, started taking my uh, completed 20 credits at Stanford uh, with a view to be, being an astrophysicist one day, but um, had a major kind of uh, awakening as one of my favorite musicians of, of my life, um, a guy called Branford Marsalis, a saxophone player. I was performing on campus at, at Stanford and um, and I ended up having the fortune, longer story for another day, but um, of, of meeting him, you know, kind of as a, a spotty teenager, um, just introduced myself to him and ended up having lunch. And he he basically was like, he, he turned my impressionable mind towards maybe I should be doing something else that's a bit more emotive and a bit more um, focused on my, my true passion, which is people. And that came down to writing songs, uh, expressing myself and, um, then I, I really wanted to make a go of it. So moved back to London, um, 18 years old. I, I kind of agreed with my my dad, uh, David Lovett, who was um, the managing director at, at Arthur Anderson. And then he was the managing partner for Alex Partners for a number of years. Um, and we made we cut a deal that I would go back to university in five years if I didn't sign a sign a record deal. Um, so I had from 18 to 23 and, and during that time I had a few things to do. I had to get some, I had to get an income because he wasn't going to support this um, in terms of cash in the, in the wallet to buy, uh, buy beers on the weekends and stuff. So I went out and started getting some, some day job work going, worked in warehouses mostly, um, did some stuff in, in recruitment, just whatever I could get paid to do. And I uh, also started a company when I was 18 uh, with a couple of friends called Communion. Uh, Communion Music, which is still around today, 16 years on uh, as a record label publishing company and a concert promotions business. And a lot of that was around trying to elevate folks that were kind of on the, the fringes of the mainstream, um, musicians who are writing songs that you may not have obviously thought of as being radio hits. Um, and finding a way to making them successful. So over those next couple of years, kind of before Manfred and Sons even became a thing, we had a lot of a lot of success doing that. And um, our kind of early early hit artists included people like Ben Howard and Michael Kiwanuka uh, and Gautier. Um, you know, that was all around the sort of 2010 time, 2009, 2010. Um, and we'd been beginning working with those artists ahead of that. Um, we got an invite as a band. So I started started the band with, with again, a few friends. Marcus and I went to school. Um, we, we go back since we were seven uh, years old together. And we decided to, to have a go uh, writing together and touring and, 
and that was an amazing kind of chemistry match. We'd actually played together in another band in our teens, uh, in early early teens. And then, you know, one thing led to another. We found ourselves out in uh, in South by Southwest um, one year. I think it was 2009. Um, we met a uh, an incredible man called Daniel Glass, um, who subsequently went on to sign the band. Um, and we were working with Universal outside of North America, but Daniel and his team at Glass Night were um, taking care of our releases for, for North America and still do. And we... It's, to, it's um, to Daniel that we owe our thank you as well. For, sorry, yeah, Daniel, just, that, yeah, Daniel made the connection. Exactly. And, um, and it sort of kept on going with, with communion. I moved to New York uh, around 2011 um, from London. And in 2015, um, decided to, having kind of seen a lot of the, the consolidation of the live events industry and a lot of the challenges for independence in the live events industry, decided to start a company called Venue Group with my brother and my dad, uh, which is still going today. Um, and we are growing, um, currently in the process of rolling out 12 uh, venues across the US and UK. Uh, we've had a lot of joy in London with a couple of places, Omira and Lafayette. And yeah, um, that's kind of my life in a nutshell. I, uh, like I said, it all comes down to being fascinated by people, the, the journey we go on, um, the emotions we feel, the interaction between us all and what makes people tick. And that has manifested itself into writing songs and putting on festivals and building venues. Um, and so when asked to have a conversation, especially with someone uh, like Roloff, I was excited um, to learn more about another human being, which is kind of why I did it. Thank you. So many things we're going to come back to from founding things to understanding people um, so Roloff, over over to you. Venture, I think we should have reversed the order. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you know, Ben as a as an artist understands the art of crescendo. I feel like I'm gonna decrescendo us here. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, so when I was presented uh, with this opportunity, I, I jumped at it because I absolutely love uh, the music that you make and many of the artists that you've supported through communion uh, are in my list, favorite songs. So I really appreciate everything you do. And you're sort of the quintessential Renaissance man with this combination of intellect and ability to study physics and, and incredible musical talent. Uh, as somebody whose children um, immediately ask him to stop humming along to songs. <laughs> I'm, I'm um, jealous in the most positive sense of the word. So admire what you do. Uh, I grew up in South Africa. So we have a collection of people here today with probably um, accents that are maybe a little bit foreign to an American audience. I finished high school in 1990, which is the year that the ANC was unbanned and Nelson Mandela was released. Um, as it turns out, my grandfather was actually a prominent politician in South Africa and he served in Nelson Mandela's cabinet uh, after the first democratic election uh, until unfortunately my grandmother passed away and he retired from politics. But he was Minister of Foreign Affairs, which is sort of an equivalent of Foreign Secretary in the United States. And it meant that I had this view of the world and an aspiration to go and play on the biggest stage if possible. So I, I decided to become a British actuary when I finished uh, high school and I went to university. So I studied actuarial science, economics, and statistics, and had a deep love of math, uh, and then realized that I probably didn't want to be an actuary. Um, got an opportunity to come to Stanford. Uh, as well. And I got an MBA here in 2000. As it turns out, there was an emerging markets currency crisis in 1998. And the RAND that I'd saved to come to Stanford lost 40% of its value, literally the month before I came. And I didn't have enough money to get through business school. And so by the time that Elon made me my third offer to join x.com PayPal, the combined company in March of 2000, I said yes because I didn't have enough money, partly, because I didn't have enough money to pay rent the next month. And so I joined PayPal while I was still at school, helped the company build its financial models, uh, joined full-time after I graduated, uh, became the CFO, took the company public the first time it went public in 2002. And then eBay acquired us later that year. Michael Moritz, who was one of the partners at Sequoia Capital after the acquisition, asked me if I'd interview. 
uh, because they were looking for somebody who had a computer science degree who was in product management at an enterprise software company. And I sort of pointed out that I didn't meet any of the three criteria, but sure, I'll interview. And I left every interview thinking it was the last interview and was surprised that they made me an offer. And for years, I was wondering whether they were going to figure out that I wasn't the person they were looking for. Uh, but it worked out in the end. Uh, I've, I've been there for 18 years. I've um, invested in a variety of companies. So I, I have really eclectic interests. So I invested in YouTube. The three founders were friends of mine from PayPal days. So there were literally just the three of them in a garage in Menlo Park when they first started. And we were their first business address. And I worked with them every day for the first couple of months as we got that business going. Um, I helped us invest in another social media company, Instagram. With my financial services background, I helped us invest in Square, where I'm still on the board. Uh, got involved there over a decade ago. I took a keen interest in bioinformatics and genetics uh, just after the Human Genome Project and invested in a company called Natera, which is now a public company. And it's the leading technology for helping people have healthy babies, uh, which is just incredible when you think about the, you know, when you go to the company's office and you see all the photographs that people send in of, of healthy babies, it, it really touches you emotionally and understanding that this company is making a huge difference in the world. Uh, and that led subsequently to our investment in 23andMe, where I'm still on the board as well. Uh, and then a couple of other companies, you know, Eventbrite in the event management space, MongoDB, a database company, Unity, which is a software development tool. Um, but just, I love learning about new businesses and I love understanding why entrepreneurs do what they do, what motivates them and where they got their ideas. Well, Rolo, if you use the word eclectic, I think like Ben, your eclectic range of interest and experience leads to pretty rich pickings for a conversation. So why, why don't we tee off with that last thought of yours, Roloff. And, you know, Ben, you're, you're obviously known worldwide as a musician, but as an entrepreneur, you're gaining an increasingly uh, prominent reputation. What, what you, you spoke about understanding people as being a driver for you. Does the motivation for starting businesses feel a bit like the motivation for being a musician or what's, what's different? What's, what's, what feels the same? I think entrepreneurship and creativity are kind of inextricably linked they, they, they use a very similar part of the brain it's just about the application right it's the creation of a of a song is the same as in in some ways the creation of a of a product pack or a an org chart or a, like it, it involves thinking of something that doesn't exist and creating it and then implementing it um same with a couplet or a melody i think that sort of the, the thing that underlies all of it for me is, is i'm just really interested to know why people do anything you know we're, we're born with no inputs we have instincts and we go about the world and things happen to us and a mixture between our kind of nature and nurture leads to a series of decisions that we make and reactions that we make that inform an entire life. And I think it's just so interesting that, you know, kind of, I, I've, I've always liked the idea of being able to chart, chart my own course. Um, Mumph and Sons is a, is a very independently minded band. Communion is a fully independent record label and promotions company, venue groups, a family business. Partly just out of a, a, an idea that you could, you could, pick up and go at any point and and that that adaptability means that you can stay true to the idea of being human you know things change and sometimes there's a lag between what's going on in the world and the markets and the financial markets especially and, and what you need to be doing um at any given moment i'm looking forward to having my very first child this year and there'll be um, impact to that and decisions that I'll make around that, that, that I will weave within my own course, within my own life. And I encourage anyone who works, that's not just a leadership thing. That's not some, that's not a, a, uh, an kind of a privilege of a CEO. I think that that's a, a culture that can be created so that you empower people to be true to themselves and ultimately be aligned with their unique genetic code because any time that we've tried to standardize and put people into boxes and stack them up into anything that feels formulaic 
I think it's failed. And the more time that we allow to kind of lift the lift the lid on that, um, the more exciting it gets. So again, for knowing that there's a you know over a hundred entrepreneurs who who share that mindset, I think I think that's really exciting um, on this on this call today. Um, I should say, and I think empowering those around us is also something that that we're going to come back to. I think Roloff, I'm I'm curious before we ask you about you know, you obsess about why are entrepreneurs doing things and, and what personal problems they're, they're, they're trying to solve. But for yourself as an investor, what do, do some of the thoughts that, that Ben shared there resonate with why you do what you do? It does. It's the, the pieces I've been thinking about is the, the creator piece. So an artist and an entrepreneur in some sense are these um, people who create something out of nothing. This beautiful piece of music didn't exist. The software that helps you achieve something didn't exist. Somebody had an idea and they not only had the idea, but they had the energy to turn that into something and probably iterated and failed along the way. These things are not linear. And I think that's sometimes taken for granted that, you know, oh, this this beautiful song pops out or this beautiful uh, poem pops out or this beautiful company pops out. It's hard work. And there's failure along the way. And there's, you know, all the drafts that are lying on the floor that nobody, nobody recognized. I mean, if you, when they do these images of the, uh, the masters and you see all the sketches that were underneath that eventually led to the beautiful painting that you see now, you realize that it's an iterative process. And so, so I love that. Uh, you know, a wonderful parallel for me with what you've done with communion is backing the unknown underdog. Yeah. Uh, the artists that you mentioned earlier, I remember the first time I listened to Gautier and, you know, I love discovering that new artist. I, I love being at the forefront of being able to tell my friends about a new musician that I've discovered. And to me, there's something similar about discovering a company that isn't yet a household name. You know, it's wonderful to be involved with businesses that once, you know, when we invested in YouTube, there were 9,000 users for YouTube, 9,000 registered users for a service that today has billions of users. It's wonderful to be at that inception and to be able to help that unknown underdog realize their ambition. And the last piece I'd say is imagination is the thing that I think is under, underappreciated when it comes to technology startups. It's really incredible to think about what these companies can turn into if you just think long term, instead of just, you know, what's going to be accomplished in the next week, the next month, you see the kernel of something, you imagine what it could be in a decade's time. The kind of the, the journey of failure is, is something to be relished. And it, it, it's something that you can practice as well. Right, you can you can practice to love it. I remember two two big things of growing up for me in my house were we had one computer uh, that we installed in the mid nineties that was like the home computer, and the password to get on that computer was anything is possible. So that basically describes my mother. And then the other thing was there was a poster outside my bedroom, which my dad had put up, which was sort of a rowing boat going off into the distance, and it said, "Success is a journey, not a destination." And I think, I think the poster, well, it's kind of a mixture of both of those to your first point, Rodolf. I think we just have to, you have to enjoy the hardships of failure and the pushbacks and because otherwise you you end up being a bitter winner, right? Even, even, even if you are lucky enough to win and there's, there's luck that is in all of this stuff. And if, if, if you haven't enjoyed how you got there, then you end up feeling quite um, kind of discombobulated. I've met I've met some people who I'm shocked at how hollow and and kind of sad their supposed riches and, and victories are and fame or whatever it is, because I don't think they've really kind of taken stock as they've gone, um, and that involves being aware, like looking up as you go and and kind of being okay with things not going okay on any, any given day and going to bed and being like, that was, that was part of the process. You know, it's a certain amount of humility or um, you, submissiveness to the process. I, I'm thrilled that you touch on luck because it's, it's uh, early in the week watching uh, an old interview of, of Roloff's to, to Stanford Business School talking about, about luck and success being both, both necessary, uh, sorry, luck and skill rather, both being necessary for success, but, but, but not, uh, sufficient on their own. Um, does maybe to you, I'd love to th talk about the, the role luck plays in, in music, uh, Ben, but maybe just before that, Roloff, does 
for, for you as an investor, are you are there are there moments in your life that you look back on where you felt, yeah, I was I was in my decision making super lucky with something that happened. I don't know. I, I picked that right, but I didn't see that, and it became a great success. And and how has how has luck played a role in your life as an investor? A huge role, uh, and I think you know. To some extent, you have to create this serendipity. So I had a sense that Silicon Valley was an incredible place sitting in South Africa. I didn't know what venture capital was when I first landed in California. But I had this intuition from everything that I'd been reading that there was something special happening with new, new company creation and changing the future here in the epicenter of technology in the Bay Area. And so I was smart enough to get here. I didn't know where it would lead. And so I'd often encourage people earlier in their career, put yourself in a position to be lucky open up doors of possibilities. The worst thing to do is to close the options that are available to you. And if you take a well-trodden path, you know, you're never going to do anything unusual or special. So take that chance, take that meeting, you know, where, whether it was, you know, one of my classmates at Stanford who introduced me to Elon, and I was interested in the intersection of financial services and technology, but serendipitously, there was this Australian friend of mine, we were on the rugby team together at the, the business school. And he said, oh, I met this guy, Elon. He's starting a fintech company. You should go meet him. And that's how that introduction happened. And I was willing to take the chance. So I think being willing to put yourself out there and being willing to look stupid sometimes. I think too often people are trapped by fear, the fear of failure. And everybody who's been successful has had so many failures. You know, Max Lefchin, who was the co-founder of PayPal, was bankrupt twice two failed companies before he started PayPal. And instead of being tail between his legs and giving up, he just persevered. And you know he had lots of other great ideas. And the next one was a huge success. And he's another huge success now with a company called The Firm. So you just you know, take another at bat, just take another chance. We've got Nelly listening in, um, and she's been a previous uh, superstar guest with with Max. So we might we might turn to Nelly later. But um, and, and Ben, to go to your father's poster of 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 success being that that journey rather than the outcome does it d- does your journey feel non-linear to use Roloff's term does it does it feel like a bumpy ride in a, in a wonderful way yeah definitely and and today i'm i'm happy that it didn't work out the way i hoped it would you know i, I went through a um a very like brutal divorce in 2015 and, and it was just all one of those life-changing moments where I saw kind of a 50 year plan crumble before my eyes. And at the time I thought, well, that's it. Everything I do from here is going to be kind of the B version of the plan A, which couldn't have been more wrong. Like every time that something major, you know, nothing's been as major as that, but anything that's been a major setback or failure in my life that I kind of have now learned to be somewhat okay and happy with the idea that that I was I was wrong that was not the way that was not the formula that was not the that was not the kind of the approach or the plan that, that was the right the right path but you can't dwell on it and I it certainly hasn't made me more fearful if anything it's made me more reckless more, more reckless and more up for the risk and and I do know people uh, who I love um, friends and colleagues and people who are very much paralyzed by fear. Um, and I just think of the, 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 the reality that we don't get to choose when we jump um, in the sense that, you know, this idea of I'll get to it tomorrow or like, I can't do that. I can't, I can't risk what I have right now because I'm trying to save up for this. And that's all assuming that you have some sort of control over your time code and what you're actual lifespan is going to be and what's going to happen you know i think that it's that life is very short even if you're lucky enough to kind of clock up the octogenarian um you know the the full the full innings um but and i just think we need to we need to be we need to embrace the idea that that there's many different chapters and potentially even different novels within our within our life to be able to just have a go it could be a complete success could be a failure, could be whatever. And then you just sort of dust yourself off and you go again. Man, I love how many lives, you know, Rodolf's a great example of this, obviously, of someone who's, who's enjoying a many life life. Um, and I, I hope to do the same, you know, and the only way to really move on to that next life is to to have a proper full 100% engagement in your current one. 
also sounds like you're uh, cut out for seed investing as well, Ben. Sorry, <laughs> over to you, Rodolf. <laughs> just, on that theme, I'm trying to think about the precise code, but Picasso said something about how, you know, to learn to paint, you almost have to go back to being a child. And as we grow older, we become so inhibited. And there's something to me about, and I tell this to young team members who join us at Sequoia, you need to maintain a certain sense of naivete, a willingness to believe, a willingness to dream. And that's what can unlock really special achievements. But as soon as you become trapped and cloistered in, in your own phobias, that's when you just end up with mediocrity. So think like a child, just don't become a curmudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> A, a quick Google suggests every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once he grows up. <laughs> um, I, I, I think for everyone listening, it's pretty self-evident how self-aware you both are and, and how thoughtful you both are. You, you, how you both plan your, your lives and your businesses, you, you both spoke to, to jumping forward 5, 10, 15 years and looking back. Um, may, maybe to start with you, Roloff, because um, you do it both for Sequoia, but you also do it for your portfolio founders. Um, could you maybe share some insight of, of how you do that and, and, uh, and, and, and what, what comes from it? Sure. So like I mentioned, I'm still on the board at Square, uh, where we invested very early, you know, in just a very small company. And Larry Summers joined the board, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary. And he gave us a fabulous exercise for an offsite event, which was to do a pre-mortem and a pre-parade. And what we ended up doing was uh, forcing the company to think about five years from now, you're wonderfully successful, you've achieved everything you imagine. Write the script for how that occurred. And then conversely, imagine it's five years from now and you, you didn't live up to those expectations. In fact, it's been a miserable failure. What might have led to that? And we apply this at our companies. We apply it to ourselves at Sequoia. We had an offsite and you know, the, the, the slide we had to fill out was 2030 obituary for Sequoia. What went wrong? And it is an incredible way to focus your mind on the first order issues because there's so many things that distract you every day as you build your company. And not to trivialize those, those, those are important decisions. But there are a couple of crucible decisions that really determine the ultimate outcome of your company. And it's very, very important for you as a founder to focus on those crucible issues and to get them right. It, it's uh, well, everyone, I think every early stage founder has got a free uh, Sequoia portfolio support lesson there on pre mortems and pre parades. Um, so I don't know, first minute might steal that um, roll off uh, caveat. Um, ben, now, uh, what, what about you? In terms By the way, of that's, that's part of the beauty of ideas. Ideas are so wonderful to share. Right. It doesn't cost me anything to share an idea like that, just like I can learn from you. And that's you know, part of what's wonderful about the ecosystem of giving in Silicon Valley is let ideas flourish. I was listening to your Bloomberg interview last week about the Sequoia memo. And it's yeah, that, that spirit of sharing, uh, I feel, is part of, at least as an outsider, it feels part of your DNA as a firm. Um, ben, what, what about you in terms of how, how, um, how your behavior is sort of shaped by um, your, your, your evident self-awareness? Well, I think um, it's interesting because a part of me challenges the five year because five years is a really long time. Um, and I, 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 do, I do wonder, and so, some of my own experiences have been what a difference a year can make and what a difference two years can make. And people sometimes can, almost like that five year falls you into that trapping I was talking about in terms of plan A. You know, there's, there's probably lots of, pre-parades and pre-mortems to be done within the five-year window as well. But but then I'm going to be even more confusingly hypocritical and say that something that drives me on is is kind of what will they say about my life and my achievements when I'm when I'm gone. So I, I actually look at my eulogy, I think about it probably morbidly too much and wonder when that time does come. And I don't get to choose when that's going to be. Have I lived well? You know, will my family be proud of me will my dependents my, my you know my loved ones will they say that i was there for them supported them will the industry that i work in say that i did something that contributed towards it rather rather than took it off course um will there be strangers who benefited you know philanthropy is somewhat of an kind of i'd like to suggest it's somewhat of a studied concept within conversations like this because it's seen as virtue signaling but it's not there's something incredibly um 
beautiful, especially if you think about a eulogy where you, your life can benefit at least one others, if not many more. Um, and if everyone had that approach, then then we wouldn't be dealing with the problems that we're dealing with, with the MDGs and all of that. So I, I do I do think about paying it forward a lot. I do think about creating up frameworks where I can be present with people around me, uh, mm. watch what I say to people. I, I tend to relationships. Um, and it's hard. It's, it's, a, it's a process that. And it keeps me, it sort of gets me out of bed in the morning. That, that being present and that intent resonates a lot. I actually... I made a, a pat with my mum a few years ago saying, let's not, you know, let's not wait until one of us has pegged it and to, for the nicest things we say about each other to be in a eulogy and just to articulate everything uh, mm-hmm. as wholesomely as possible, fulsomely as possible while we're all still here. Um, maybe to shift uh, gears a little bit, um, Ben, uh, you're investing. What do you invest in? Do you do tech investing? Uh, how does how does it, um, lots of, yeah, lots of people I'm sure would love to, to know how you how you think about that. I've invested in a bunch of stuff. I, I think similar to Roloff, it normally starts with a uh, fascination about the, the why, uh, the entrepreneur, like what's what's made them tick. Sometimes more so than even what they've figured out this time around. I like to sometimes just kind of jump in with people who I, I just believe in. Um, I've, I've done various things, done, done a, a, like a social platform, um, a fashion company there's a great um menswear company called lestrange uh, which I, I supported a few years ago and they just got named in ft's fastest growing companies as the second fastest growing fashion brand out of the uk and so that i'm very proud of them i i definitely don't do it from a i do it all pretty pretty quietly i don't you know this is probably the only forum i ever talk about investing in companies given the nature of the audience but Generally speaking, I like to kind of elevate the people whose idea it was rather than be the person who theoretically helped them grow. Um, but I, I sit through maybe currently, I'd say four calls a week as, a, wow. as an investor and as an advisor um, and give my, give my two cents and my feedback. And, and it's normally just a, a slightly left field point of view, um, but it seems to go down well. And I, I, I enjoy it. And then on the artist side, obviously been investing for years. You know, record labels are investment companies at the end of the day. You invest in the careers and the catalogs of artists, um, sometimes before they've even written the songs. And um, you nurture it and you grow with them. And there's lots of risk involved in that um, and have had some successes and some failures doing that. But yeah, you know, I think, I think investment uh, is all around us in lots of different ways. And I've, I've, I've done my, my fair share, but nothing like what you guys do as professional investors. But uh, yeah, Roloff's is a slightly different league having backed a fair few totemic businesses in the last two <laughs> decades. Um, we've just got started, but Roloff, what's your killer tip for Ben on, as he, as he does his four pitches a week, what would, what would you say, don't forget X? Don't forget, you mean as he's evaluating a, an idea? Exactly, exactly. So I think part of the skill that you've developed in is understanding people. So if you can spot artists, sort of understanding the individual and judge, not judging them in a sort of judgmental sense, just sort of evaluating them, I think is a very important skill for a startup company because you're backing the founders. Mm-hmm. But you don't have years of financials and proven business models. You're backing people. It's a people business at the end of the day. And you have to win their confidence and you have to believe in them. You have to believe in their idea and that they have the stamina to persevere and go through the challenges of building a company because it's not up and to the right. It's a roller coaster ride with tremendous setbacks. And it might seem glamorous to be a startup founder. It's hard. You know, when I was at PayPal, we had three near-death experiences in the time that I was there. You know, the fraudsters were trying to kill us. We didn't have a business model initially. Then eBay was trying to kill us. I mean, it's difficult. And, you know, you read these newspaper articles, Earth to Palo Alto, and they were making fun of us, thinking that we were, you know, delusional. <laughs> and you need, you need to be able to shed those things and just let it roll off your back. The thing yeah. I look for when I, when I meet a company is understanding the why. We've spoken about that. What, what gave rise to this idea? What was the eureka moment that had you understand that this is an opportunity? 
And it's fascinating to understand the origin story for a company. And it says so much about the depth of understanding that somebody has about a particular field um, and their understanding of what it takes to solve it, not just at a first order level, but all, all the way down. Because if there were a good solution, they would probably have picked it. They wouldn't have <laughs> dared to build a company around it. So after the why, I really want to understand what is your value proposition? Explain to me why the product or idea that you have is such a compelling solution to the problem that you've described. And then I figure out much later about, you know, can you turn it into business? Because if you can deliver incredible value to an acute problem, to a large audience, you've got all the ingredients you need to get going. I, I as a follow on to that, Roloff, have a slightly selfish question, which is every time we make a seed investment, I feel like I have a sort of minor existential crisis that there's a huge information gap. We don't know how the market's evolving. We don't have enough information, as you said, really revenue, et cetera. When, when you look back at the moment of decision-making over your 18 years at Sequoia, all the, the Unities and 23andMe's and Instagrams and YouTubes, as well as the ones that didn't work, was there a large variance between how confident you felt at the time of investment as to, yes, we should do this? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think you get better over time and your judgment clearly improves. I think clearly if I look back to the early part of my career, I was confident of decisions that there were things that I should have learned. <laughs> you know, part of the analogy I gave people is yeah. chess players can be world-class at the age of 18. Founders can be world-class at the age of 18. Surgeons are not because surgeons need a decade or two of experience and they probably become really good by the time they're 40, not when they're 20. And I feel there's something similar about investing where you gain experience over time. You see, you see examples of things and it's, it never repeats precisely but you draw from those experiences to improve your judgment over time. And as you improve your judgment, your confidence improves, but I'd still say you need to dare because there are so many unknowns at the point that you intersect with the company. I mean, just last year, I made a seed investment with, you know, before the company's formation documents were ready because the person described an idea and I loved it. I just, I fell in love with the idea. And part of what I look for is, can I, can I get rid of the idea? If, if the next day I struggle to remember the meeting, then it's probably not a good sign. And in fact, I just can't let go of the idea. If I want to tell people compulsively about this wonderful idea I just heard, that to me is a great sign of something that I want to be involved with. We have Phil Libin also listening in. I'm wondering if it's Phil, but I won't, <laughs> won't, won't put you on the spot. Um, ben, maybe I, we've got lots of questions coming through. So I think I'll turn to questions in, in four or five minutes. Um, the Maybe... To, to think about the intersection of music and tech, streaming is something that we're seeing lots of early stage companies uh, plan towards. Do you think, Ben, that that could change the music landscape, like how people consume music content and therefore how artists produce that content? Is that something that you're thinking about lots? I really hope we don't get to a place where people are creating upside down i.e. The, the window in is like the, the, the instigation. That's, that's almost like you, you read about, you know, NFTs and suddenly you want to go and try and figure out how to be in crypto and NFT. Like it, it's not about chasing the success. And I, I would hope that even in the developments in streaming and, and the idea that we're having an amazing amount of universality of, of of access to creativity isn't going to mean that people are trying to kind of hardwire into that system and find a way to maximize the the output. Um, no, I think I think actually what what we're there's a lot of noise up here, right? There's a lot of headlines, a lot of things. And remember, a lot of those headlines have been fed by some PR agency that are trying to tell a story to try and shed some light on something that's probably not going very well. What's going on underneath all of that, I think, is a retreat to the more real. I think that, that what we're seeing with certain artists um, in music is, is they're, they're finding a journey inward to be the most authentic and honest version of themselves. And because of the way in which access is so universal now, <clears throat> people can un people can touch that. We're not kind of in the era of costumes and pretense. It's like 
you're kind of exposed for the reality of who you are. So, so if I was to say anything to a musician right now, I wouldn't be like trying to second guess what the next tech development is, not like go and figure out your TikTok algorithm. I'd say go and sit down with a guitar or a piano and go and write the best song of your life. And luckily, more people around the world in 2021 will be able to hear that in a shorter amount of time than ever before. But if you haven't got anything to start that, if there's nothing real at the beginning, then you're here today, gone tomorrow. And we're seeing a lot of that, and it makes up a lot of sort of fluff and noise in that higher level. But there's still career artists to come, and they're the ones that are really focusing on sort of what their value proposition is, what their internal why is as an artist. Um, and technology can amplify things incredibly effectively right now, but I just wouldn't. I would never get art through technology, no. The the word authenticity came to mind as you were saying that, Ben, because yeah. that's what we look for in entrepreneurs as well. It's that authentic connection between the entrepreneur and the problem that they're solving. Yeah, exactly. How do you, how, how there's a question on that um, from, from Raj in the audience, Roloff. How do you test for authenticity? You ask the person questions and you try to understand their motivations. So part of the questions are to understand how deeply they understand the problem at hand whether they are trying to build a company for the sake of building a company, that doesn't work. I don't think you can become a great artist because you want to be a great artist. You become a great artist because you feel something deep and you've got talent and passion and you can't bottle it. <laughs> you, can't, you can't force it out. You, you're trying to restrain it almost. You know, one of the quotes we have is, our business is best um, trying to hang on to thoroughbreds than pushing mules. And you want, to, you want to get that person who just has that authentic energy and truly wants to solve a problem. And they don't really care how big a business they're going to build. In my career, I have not come across entrepreneurs who walk in and say they want to get rich or they want to build a big business. It starts with the idea, the problem, the customer they're trying to serve. The business size is a consequence. And now turning over to Q&A. David uh, Pemsel, uh, uh, the Guardian, launched their venture arm, is now doing exciting new things. So, David, why don't you kick off? Perfect. Thank you. Look, what an amazing conversation with two, two, two human beings who kind of get it. And it's, it's, it's lovely to hear. I suppose I had multiple questions. I, I think I'm sorry to say that one of them probably is related to NFTs and just trying to see whether your two brains could pick through the reality of whether you think this is real. I do think perhaps from an artist's point of view that, if you see some of the positive news written around those sorts of currencies, is it possible for individuals now to build deeper, more immersive relationships with their communities and find a currency that is sort of dependent on the quality of their output than the dependency of an algorithm of a platform? And I wondered whether you felt that there was some good that could come from these uh, currencies or whether you think it's just hype. I've been on a bit of a crash course, David, for the last, I think as many of us have, but the last sort of four or five weeks, I live with um, a couple of friends um, and one of them owns a company called Neon Gold, which is a record label. Um, and he's got deep into the NFT space. He's up all night on Clubhouse and I, I managed to get like a half an hour coffee sort of digestion in the morning. And where I sit on it now is is... Yes, I do really like the idea that there's a leveler component to it. There's a, you know, I'm kind of pretty socialistic in my thinking and I like the idea that there can be a dispersal rather than this algorithmic, like celebrate the kind of the queen bee type mentality. I, I, I love that. Obviously, communion's very much on that wavelength. Um, I also think that the principle of an NFT is, is kind of... Um, it's kind of fun. I don't. I don't know whether I buy into the amount in which people are spending around. I think. I think the the premise that something can be worth something just because someone ascribes value to it, I think, is actually uh, pretty righteous. That is art, right? If you look at kind of poetry and songs for over the years, um, you know the three words "let it be." That's like that means so much to so many millions of people and has generated so much value, um, both economic and otherwise. 
But at the end of the day, you know, you could just say, well, it's the same as just a, I'm not paying three million pounds for a JPEG. And it's like, I'm not doing that with three words, let it be. Like, what's the big deal with that? But it, it wasn't that. It was the intention behind the art and people got it. Like, if they didn't get it, they wouldn't have cared. And I guarantee you that tens of thousands of songs go, go out every day and people don't react to them. So it's not that straightforward to do this stuff. And I think that what Blau has done and, you know, Young and Six doing it, like, they, they, it might seem obvious to other people to, how to, like, cheat that system. But I, I actually think there's something more going on. And it's probably going to be around for at least the, the remainder of this year, if not, if not beyond. What about you, Olaf, on NFTs? I'm scratching my head around NFTs because to some extent it feels like DRM finally that works. <laughs> um, what I'm probably more excited about is the idea that you can build better tools for creators in general. And that's part of the reason Square acquired Tidal uh, recently. I don't know if you saw that announcement. And I don't know exactly how much NFTs or other things form part of what we'll eventually build here, but this idea that you can build far better tools for creators than exist today. And you get rid of the the phenomenon of yesteryear with middlemen controlling the distribution and the selection that we all benefit from. And today that's algorithmic. What is the future? The future has to be different to help connect fans with artists they love. And and what I'm excited about with crypto in general is can it change the way that the economics flow? Because ad supported business models have meant that we are the product by definition. And you see the the wave of, um, change against that, that people don't want to be the product. And the intrusion that it presents to our personal lives with all our information being sold and bartered is, you know, people are resenting that. So I'm really enthusiastic about maybe NFTs or maybe other forms of cryptocurrency enabling artists to get paid for their work in a way that just is far more authentic. Um, and, you know, so that's all I have to say. David, thank you. Um, Paul, nice to see you. Hi, I'm just interested to hear what uh, the panel have to say about the evolution of uh, the organization for early stage companies. A lot of people talking about staying fully distributed. Other companies are saying perhaps uh, hybrid solutions are going to be the way to go. My my concern is that I think that um, being distributed works quite well for people who are further on in their careers People have families and kids, great to be at home. But if you're early in your career, if you're young, you're single, perhaps, um, you're going to benefit more from perhaps being in the office from an emotional point of view, from a um, mentoring point of view. These kind of serendipitous conversations that, in fact, Norella, if you talked about in uh, what one should be looking for uh, early in your careers, you get those uh, face-to-face in person, not necessarily so much if you're sitting at home looking at a screen. So how do you think we can square this sort of desire to be, to stay distributed uh, together with um, uh, having the benefits of, uh, of being in person? As as someone sat in the office, Paul, I love that question. Um, Paul co-founded indeed.com. I agree with you on the need for human connection. All the surveys I've seen at our own company suggest that there is a minority of maybe 15 to 20% of people who truly want to stay remote, but the vast majority of people want to be back in the office or in a hybrid fashion where they maybe have the flexibility to spend a day a week doing uh, work from home and ability to focus and not be distracted with too many meetings at the office. And I, I can't really think that's the future. Often companies that are distributed still have pockets of excellence. So Unity, where we, you know, I got involved with the company in 2009 when there were 30 people in Copenhagen, they were a a global organization from the get-go and they have development offices in over a dozen countries. But where those offices reside, they're often able to concentrate talent. And so people can go to an office in Montreal or in Copenhagen or in San Francisco or in Singapore and meet with other like-minded people. And some people have been remote completely from the get-go at that company as well. So I think we'll end up with that kind of a hybrid solution. But I think the idea that all of us are going to be on our own, working from home or living in the office, as I like to say, indefinitely, I just don't think that's the future. We're a social species by definition. So that's my prediction. That'll be be music to Brent's ears right off. Our own experience at Venue Group with uh, with the offices, and we actually asked the staff, um, kind of what they want um, and we've got 
we've got locations in London and Nashville and Austin. Um, and 75% of people said they wanted to go into a hybrid, similar to what Rodolf just said, um, with a few people saying they want to go to work every day, which we uh, can understand because their living situation might not be such that they actually want to work remotely. Uh, and some people want to be remote all the time, which happens to be the people with the best at-home working situations. Um, so I do think that our plan and, and a lot of the projects that we're working on that involve mixed-use kind of office stuff next to the venues that we're building uh, assumes that there's always going to be a role for it. The collaboration between people, I think, is critical. And then also the kind of after-work element, uh, which is the kind of the social work component, I think, is where people form connections and trust that's critical to these businesses actually having some sort of mesh, the human part beyond that's function and form. Kara's co-founder of Bright Cure, which is our first product is a bioactive cream to help women with the pain of, of UTIs. So Kiara, over to you. Um, yeah, I think my question is a bit more general. Um, and I think I really loved like um, also your your conversation about like, kind of like enjoying the journey and um, and 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 yeah, and also, you know, celebrating like failures and learned lessons. So I think I would be more generally interested along now all these journeys and all these different kind of uh, lifetime projects you, you two um, had so far, what is your, your greatest learned lesson that you could, for example, share with someone like me who's quite early on in this journey um, and is now, you know, starting kind of the first company? I think I'll, I'll just quickly say what, what I've summed up to the team, to the same venue group team this, this year is our core three things that I want the team to focus on. Um, we can say these are learnings of the last couple of years, and this has been kind of the biggest learnings that I've had as a CEO, as an entrepreneur, um, and you know, the company has now grown um, to being worth over 100 million. So I'm, I'm sort of at that stage now where I'm starting to really look back on what we've done right and wrong. And three things. Well-being is number one. Burnout's not cool, right? So, so like just, just making sure that, that, that encouraging people as you build your team to not try and impress you or other people in the company by staying the extra hour or putting the extra shift in. I think those days are done. I think you have to be able to find a way to balance being intense and having productive output with having an actual life. If you if you don't want turnover, if you don't want people blowing up at the wrong moments in the wrong presentation or whatever. So number one's well-being. Number two is decisiveness. I think decisiveness is why we've come out stronger from the pandemic than a lot of other people in our industry. And it's really important to be able to get all the information you need, be able to make a decision and empower others within the organization to be able to make a decision. Now, even if that is your kind of most junior staff member, you need to be clear to them what decisions they can make and, and encourage them to make that decision. Because if they just sit there kind of paralyzed, waiting to be told off for doing something right or wrong, you're never going to be able to grow. So I think decisiveness is critical within the company. And the third one was patience. That's the other, that's the other third theme of our company this year is, is being patient to not try and get it all done at once. And that a lot can happen in a year or two. And you just sort of let it, let it naturally grow at the pace that it wants to grow at without forcing it too much. Um, there's, a, there's a record executive called Darkest Beast who for many years ran Ireland Records. And I've, I've always admired him. And he said to me once when I was struggling to get a certain artist's career off the ground through communion, he said, stop swimming upstream. <clears throat> find your downstream. Every now and then you need to swim upstream, but find what the downstream is and go with it. And then you're going to still be floating and you're not going to wear yourself out. So the kind of the patience factor, I think, is really key. Um, and those would be my, my three, one rule. <laughs> Nelly, welcome back. Um, All right. Hi. Thank you for having me uh, back. Hi, uh, <laughs> oh, well, to, to see two visionaries. So my question is actually for Roloff. So when you do early stage funding and uh, to some extent you're betting that the company will anticipate and solve not a need of today, but a need that's, that is pressing when the product is somewhat more mature. Um, so give or take three years from now, while you have to bet on people and it's a primary bet, you have to remain a visionary too. So with a visionary hat on, what do you anticipate are the biggest problems three years from now in both consumer and enterprise? Wow. 
<laughs> I'll give you 30 seconds to <laughs> 10 seconds to chew on it, roll off. Well, with that tough question, Nelly, I don't know if I'm going to share my champagne with you next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. You know, the physicist Niels Bohr said the future is hard. To, uh, what, a prediction is very hard, especially about the future. So um, I think for enterprises, the biggest challenge is going to be the shift to cloud. We're still in the very early innings of people moving their infrastructure or from company-owned data centers to the cloud. Um, for us that live in Silicon Valley, it feels like yesterday's news because our companies have already been doing it, but it, it's a big wave that is still going to roll over most of the world. And coupled with that is how enterprises are going to take advantage of data and machine learning and artificial intelligence to really make their businesses systems of intelligence rather than just systems of engagement. So I think that's the biggest challenge for enterprises. And I think the availability of data scientists and machine learning specialists is very low relative to the need. And so that's going to be a huge bottleneck. So I think I'm very interested in companies that really help improve the productivity of the existing engineering and data science teams, because that is an incredible bottleneck from a recruiting point of view. On consumer, I think um, we're seeing a resurgence in consumer. And I think part of it is that people are tired of the beer moths that, that control our lives, where the products have become maybe a little bit stale. We, they all have advertising-based business models where we feel we're the product. And for the first time in several years, we're seeing people really experiment with new ideas. And so I think the opportunity in some sense for consumer is reimagining media in particular. Um, I think commerce is obviously on a very strong trajectory, especially accelerated by COVID. But I think media companies are going to be reinvented. And you're going to see the emergence of many more consumer-facing um, services than you have in the last five years. Stefan's question was um, uh, actually also to you, Roloff, but that may be something that... Um, Ben could chime in was what, you, what got you excited first about, uh, about YouTube and Instagram? Because we, we have conversations in the first minute. Yeah. Of, is there going to be an Instagram of music one day? But um, okay. uh, you, over to you, Rodolf. So with YouTube, the memo is actually available on the web. If you do a search, you know, YouTube investment memo, you can go find it. It was uh, disclosed as part of the lawsuit um, with Universal Music um, against YouTube or against Google YouTube, so you can go find it. So you can actually see what I wrote, so I don't have to make stuff up. <laughs> and part of what you'll notice, by the way, is that at no point could we have imagined that the company would be as big as it turned out to be. That's one of the lessons for me about startup investing. Solve an authentic problem, and you will be surprised to the upside. There was no notion at the time that we thought that the company would be as big as it's turned out to be. There was a quality of the product experience that was unrivaled. So if you just went and used the product, it was so different from any of the video services that existed at the time. And they were many. I mean, it's one of those classic things where it's very easy to not invest because you see a dozen competitors and why does this one stand out? But it's the same as, you know, somebody who plays music and just plays a few notes off key, you notice. And suddenly it's not a beautiful piece of music. Even if it's 99% accurate, it just doesn't quite sound right. And there was something about how the founders put together something that was truly beautiful and truly easy to use. I had videos that had been stuck on my hard drive from uh, my honeymoon that I'd never shared with anybody. And I was effortlessly able to upload them and share them with friends and family around the world. And that was an unlock as a, as a user that just opened up my imagination to what could happen uh, with YouTube as a user-generated content site. Instagram, the metrics was, were incredible. It was the early days of mobile. Users loved the product. <laughs> I'm, I know that Roloff has got something right after, and I'm sure Ben does as well. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to you both. Um, uh, really, yeah, what a fascinating, wonderful way to end a week here in London. Um, Roloff, enjoy your well-earned break. And uh, Ben, real, real p pleasure to talk. And thank you again for Daniel for making it happen. Um, but yeah. thank you to you both. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, pleasure. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.